a little bit different experience for this year. So Ezra, shall we start or shall we wait a couple of more minutes? What I think, think we can start. I don't want to wait the other uh, participants, so. All right, uh, okay, I think I agree with you. Again, uh, good morning to you all. Welcome to the our third session of the Media and Communications webinar organized by the Journalists and Writers Foundation and Stony Brook University School of Communication and Journalism. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate today's uh, session. And my name is Mehmet Kılıç. I serve as the president of the Journalists and Writers Foundation, uh, which is an international civil society organization dedicated to the culture of uh, peace, human rights, and sustainable development. Uh, before I introduce uh, uh, this week's topic and our guest speaker, I would like to remind some of the house rules and uh, the format. Uh, after this uh, brief introduction, our guest speaker will present his topic for 30 minutes. Then we will have uh, 20 minutes of Q&A session. Uh, this uh, Q&A session is for an interactive discussion. So we would like you to join uh, the discussion with your questions and comments and ideas uh, because we have participants from different parts of the world. So your perspectives, your ideas are very valuable to us. And at the end of the session, I will provide you some uh, you know, information about the journalism project. I think you have some questions about that. And then uh, lastly, you know, this session is recorded and it will be shared with you after the webinar session. And uh, all resources are available, the reading resources for you to read before coming to the webinar session. And uh, I encourage you to check our website. It's, at uh, jwfacademy.org. So uh, for week three, our topic is freedom to access information. And our guest speaker is going to talk about advocating for the right to freedom of inf information, particularly on accessing public information, fake news, disinformation, and impact on journalism and democracy, which is another important topic impact of blocking internet portals and social media platforms uh, across the globe. And lastly, role of civil society in right to information, laws, reform, and practice. Now, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. JJ Green. Uh, he is the national security correspondent at WTOP Radio. He reports daily on international security, intelligence, foreign policy, terrorism, and cyber developments with on-air analysis. He hosts uh, the weekly pod podcast, uh, U uh, Target USA, which examines the threats facing the US and hosts the weekly broadcast program, The Hunt. In his programs, he conducts in-depth interviews with experts on emerging terrorist groups and the threats. Uh, he has many awards, uh, and some of them are, uh, are uh, uh, Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation Award, which he received in 2017 for distinguished reporting on national defense for his serious anatomy of a Russian attack. Uh, he also received a National Edward R. Murrow Award in 2009 for his serious hidden hunter. And uh, another one I would like to share with you is the prestigious Associated Press Douglas S. Freeman Award for his investigative series dignity denied. Uh, Mr. Green has also been recognized by top national security officials for his deep knowledge of international affairs and ability to analyze complex issues. Uh, Mr. Green lectures regularly at universities and colleges on national security issues and speaks on, uh, often on uh, US government, military and national security organizations. And he is also a contributor to Jane's Intelligence Intelligence Review magazine. Uh, you can find uh, his PO on www. Uh, I mean www.wtop.com, and uh, I will share this link with you. And Mr. Green, the floor is yours, sir. Well, Mr. Killick, thank you. As always, it's a great pleasure to be with you and your organization. The Journalist and Writers Foundation is a godsend to the world because. It does things that uh, other organizations can't do. You've demonstrated your capability to pull people together from all over the world for a very serious look at issues that need to be dealt with and issues that are urgent. 
and these issues that we're discussing today, freedom of uh, freedom to access information is the, in my opinion, the most important uh, element that's facing journalists right now. And I'd like to say to Ezra Aiden, thank you for all that you do for the Journalist and Writers Foundation and for reaching out uh, and coordinating this. And thank you to all of you for joining today. Um, and I have a few things that I want to talk about. I'm going to do a bunch of reading today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be looking off camera as I'm reading because I want this all to make sense. But I also realized that I have a very monotonous voice and sometimes people get sleepy. So if you feel yourself getting sleepy, stand up, turn around or do some exercises and let's get back to it. But I don't wanna lose you because this is a very, very important day, a very, very important time and a very, very important topic. So let me begin. Uh, again, good morning to all of you and thank you for coming and thank you to the Journalists and Writers Foundation for inviting me to participate in this important series. So I've traveled uh, to numerous countries and have spoken to everyone from heads of state to prison inmates. Being a journalist is a privilege that comes with a great deal of responsibility. Primarily, it's important to be truthful in your storytelling, accurate with details and objective in the development of your stories. Observing the rights of people and organizations we cover is another of those responsibilities. That being said, journalists have rights as well. There have been numerous attempts in recent years to diminish the credibility of our profession and to portray journalists as the enemy of the people. We are not. We are, in fact, the surrogates for people, people who can't be in the places we go to cover the news of the day and the events of our time. Reporting on a story requires a journalist to be aware of as many of the facts as possible. And we often run into situations where people and organizations try to block our access to information we need to tell our stories. They employ many different tactics. We will discuss some of this during our session today. We will also discuss how to get around these obstructions. Freedom of access to information, it's important. What is it? Let's start with that. The right of access to information is a specific manifestation of freedom of expression. There are numerous laws and legal guarantees around the world that support the basic and ethical principle of freedom to access information. In the US specifically since 1967, the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA as it's called has provided the public with the right to request and access records from any federal government agency. It's often described by the law that keeps citizens in the know about their government. Federal agencies are required to disclose any information requested under FOIA unless it falls under one of several exemptions which protects interests such as personal privacy, national security, and law enforcement. But there are other, often more significant roadblocks to accessing information that we as journalists have a right to. There are several categories that I'm gonna talk about today. The gatekeepers, those are the people that try to protect organizations and colleagues from scrutiny or trying to manipulate the flow of information. Two, there are public officials and organizations that may have something to hide. And three, believe it or not, other journalistic organizations, they often hire and prevent sources of information of interest from doing it. It's not illegal, but it still goes against the spirit of the principles of freedom of information. Advocating for the right to freedom of information, particularly for accessing public information. It's important for as many journalists and consumers of news to stand up for this principle right now, this very moment, this very day, this very time. Because if we don't, then what we get and what we are seeing some glimpses of is a, a society completely separated from the truth. Fake news and disinformation and its impact on journalism and democracy. Corrupt and repress, repressive nation states and non-state actors like QAnon and extremist organizations, both domestic and international, traffic in this kind of activity. But they can only be successful if we are not here out here seeking, telling, and reinforcing the truth. 
there is a common thread that runs through all of this and all of these entities that I mentioned. And I want to talk about this for a moment. Radicalization and, isol and, and isolation. And here's how it works. These organizations, they seek out people who are vulnerable uh, to their lies. We might as well call it what they are. People who are likely to believe their lies and misinformation, and then they empathize with these people in some way, try to form a bond or a connection to them. Next, they isolate these people and separate them from other rational people, including family members, and they connect them with other people, only the other people who believe the same lies that these organizations and groups are spreading. So you have people who are surrounded by only those people who believe what they believe, further reinforcing what the group believes and reinforcing that they are right about whatever their issue is, even though it can be completely false. So they continue to feed these conspiracy theories and they seek to motivate people to take action. This is precisely what happened during the Capitol riot on January 6th, 2021, here in Washington. People were radicalized and they did not even realize it. And I can tell you for sure, covering that particular event, you had people coming from all corners of this country. You had people that had been engaged in conversations on encrypted platforms and in secret places that were plotting attacks against the Capitol, against journalists, against legislators, against people that didn't look like them. And they were doing this because they believed that the current president at the time, Donald Trump, was going to somehow declare martial law and resume um, resume his, his, or engage in his second term as president, which was far from the truth. He had lost the election fairly and squarely. Joe Biden won that election. And all of the uh, evidence that was put out there by the state's uh, secretaries of state in all of the 50 states essentially uh, back that up. But there were people who did not believe it. They simply did not believe it. Why did they not believe it? It's because they were in these echo chambers, these echo chambers that are basically driven by organizations like the QAnons and many of these other organizations that that are out there on, on some of these social media platforms and encrypted platforms. You find them on Telegram, you find them on WhatsApp, you find them on Signal, you find them everywhere. But these people had become so caught up in this rhetoric, many of them, you know, they lost their, their families, you know, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they were completely radicalized. And I can tell you how this works. Back in the um, late 90s, and early 2000s, and certainly in the mid 2000, in, in, in the 2015 timeframe, when the terror group Al Qaeda, and the, the other terror group, ISIS, began uh, their rises, specifically Al-Qaeda, back in the early 2000s, uh, what they did was they would recruit people, and they would put these people in holding locations, cut off from their families, cut off from anything except what they were told by this organization, by Al-Qaeda. ISIS did the same thing, and they put them in these echo chambers and these people had nothing or no way to find out what the truth was. It was a psychological prison that they were in. That's what disinformation is. That's what fake news is, or I should say, that's what they do. They create these doubts about what is real, about what is truthful. And in some cases, people go to the extreme uh, of uh, taking action. And I'm sure most of you have heard about it in one way, shape, or form about the Pizzagate um, uh, situation that happened here in the U.S. I think it was back during um, President Obama's term where an individual in North Carolina read uh, numerous times and, and watched on numerous occasions uh, videos, et cetera, that reinforced this lie that there was a pizza parlor here in Washington that that operated a child pedophile uh, sex operation in the basement of this pizza restaurant. 
I mean, and this individual got into his vehicle, drove to Washington with the weapon and went to that pizza place during the height of their work, looking for this hidden sex pedophile ring, which didn't exist. This is the power of disinformation. This is the power of fake news. And this is the reason why we have to do everything we can to make sure that the truth is sought, it's told, and it's reinforced. The impact of blocking internal portals and social media platforms on society, well, this is sort of connected to this. And what I mean by this is there are some nation states that do that. You know, Russia and China are known for that. Uh, they don't want people to know certain things. They don't want, North Korea does it as well. They don't want people to know the truth about what's going on around them. Uh, the former Soviet Union was very good at this. And let's just be clear about this. It's called fake news now. It's called disinformation now, but it's not new. This is something that's been out there for decades. It was a major part of the Cold War. Uh, that was instituted by the USSR. What's happened now in the era of social media, in the era of tech, high technology and um, multiple platforms and, 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 and mobile devices, it's gone from being uh, delivered through word of mouth and through flyers that were printed and handed out all over the place to instantaneous, in, instantaneously being passed on to people via. Uh, these mobile devices that we all have at least one, two, three, four, five of, you know, we have so many of them. So this um, prevents people blocking um, internal portals and social media platforms. Um, you know, this prevents people from finding out the truth. And this is another thing that we as journalists have to take on wholeheartedly and people interested in journalism. We have to deal with how to get around these blocks and these, these places and these situations that won't give us the truth about what it is that we need to know about. So I want to start with um, a part of this element getting around many of these blockades, which are often um, endorsed and operated by governments. And, you know, we live here in the U.S., which many believe, and I believe it is, a free country. But there are people here who don't necessarily understand the importance of freedom of access to information. There are people here in the U.S. and in other places around the world, and I'm going to be honest and fair about this. There are some people in government who may not be happy about what I'm about to say. But um, one of the things that we face right now is a growing propensity for people who are public affairs officers to be narcissistic, to be arrogant and deceitful, all in the name of their cause or their political process or motive. And I call this noble causes, but suspicious motives. And I'm gonna to read to you a little bit of a piece that I wrote in case some of you have not had a chance to read this. Um, so that you understand better what I'm saying. Journalism has found itself at the crossroads of duty and the lure of celebrity. Celebrity is not a dirty word. It's a necessity. It's a necessary element of our society. Those blessed with celebrity, uh, which with, comes with it uh, power and resources, those blessed with it are often able to champion the causes of the disadvantaged but the path to celebrity can run through some very dark places. And I can tell you for sure that there is a situation where, let me just pick this phone up and stop it. Um, for some reason, I've been getting robo calls. Apologies. Um, let me just do that again. Celebrity is not a dirty word. It's a necessary element of our society. Those blessed with it often use the attendant power and resources to champion the cause of the disadvantaged. But the path to celebrity, as I mentioned, can run through some dark places inhabited by a strain of people for which it is everything and anything less is failure. 
Celebrity, which can deliver privilege, money, and power, often comes with a cost, a sacrifice that leeches away the time, privacy, and even principles, and often duty. So emblazoned on these big glass windows that we have here at the office where I work, WTLP, are the words, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom or freedom of speech or of the press. But that ironclad guarantee for journalists from our nation's founders has been obscured in the world of public affairs journalism by a growing toxic cloud of intolerance, self-aggrandizement, and blatant abuses of power. The dark mist hangs over journalism and public affairs, official like, public affairs officials like a stubborn cloak of contamination. The majority of federal agencies that I deal with have been willing to fulfill interview requests and information requests, but some have been reluctant for one reason or another. And I can tell you for sure, in the last four years, I encountered that very, very, very often. In more than 20 years of covering the U.S. government agencies, I've noticed a slow, degree-by-degree degree turn away from standard access practices. If you or your organization are not a celebrity in the eyes of some of these gatekeepers, the likelihood you'll get locked out is growing. A little more than a decade ago, some of the tactics of U.S. government public affairs operations began to shift. Instead of the all access posture towards all accredited press organizations, they began more to become more selective about which media would receive information about and under whatever circum what circumstances they would get this information. So the bottom line on it is they started this change of, okay, if you ask and you're accredited, you can get it to this idea of, well, maybe we might want to give it to you, but only after we give it this information to other organizations that we like better than you. Some of these folks did not, I honestly think, did not realize that that essentially creates a propaganda operation. When a government starts giving information to people in journalistic organizations so that they can essentially promote or talk about or discuss whatever it is the government wants uh, favorably, well, that's, that's, that's pretty much propaganda. We as journalists have the right and should exercise it on a regular basis to push back. We should not be in a scenario where we are essentially viewed by any government organization as a preferred media outlet. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I can't remember exactly the date, but I believe that this was about seven years ago. There was a person who worked at the White House and uh, I wanted to get some information about something. This information were said, this person said to me um, after I made the request, we would refer you to this organization, another news organization, to get this information because they have our statement. Does anybody see anything wrong with that? I mean, <laughs> so I said to them, listen, it's not my job to go to another news organization to find out what your perspective is. It's my job to talk to you. And it's your job to tell me. I said, when you start authorizing other media organizations to speak for you, that is the full essence of a propaganda operation. And you know, it was at that point that I think this individual and the organization began to realize, wow, okay. But they didn't make any changes. They double down. That's the arrogance that I was talking about. Problematic, you know, and this is something that we need to deal with. And today, some government organizations have essentially slammed the door on accredited press that they simply don't want to be bothered with. And there are three warning signs that you often run into with these situations. There are leaks. U.S. government news leaks or, or news leaks anywhere have been around for a very long time. But often what happens is organizations, again, these favorable organizations, information is leaked to them so that they can essentially have it because they're favorable to this particular government agency. That's wrong. There's another tactic that they use. It's called the lag. You know, one thing they will do is they'll keep telling you, 
if you make a request for information, sure, I'll get back to you. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, you know, th the person you want to speak to is not here. Um, uh, or, you know, um, next week is a better time. That basically is what we call slow walking. Don't stand for it. Do not allow it to happen. Push back with everything you have on this. And then there's this thing called the lie. You know, a lot of people think that it's simply okay to tell a lie if you're in government because of this whole idea about security of information. You know, that may be appropriate in some cases, in some situations, but I can tell you there are numerous and many situations that happen regularly where people lie and they are simply lying because one, they don't care for the news outlet or two, they don't care for the, the journalist or the reporter and three, they may have something to hide or, and four, they simply aren't aware of what the rules of engagement are when it comes to dealing with the press and five, perhaps they don't care. And this is a part of the reason why it's really, really important for all of us as journalists to continue pushing back against all of these problematic issues and elements. The role of civil society in the right to information laws reform and practice. Well, that has to happen. And this has to happen regularly. Civil society is a part of what makes this whole democracy experiment work in the US and in other places around the world. Civil society has to throw its weight behind what's real, what's tangible, what's true, what's beneficial. And the press can help these societies do this and can help them do this on a regular basis. So these things that I've mentioned to you and uh, I've written way more than we actually have time to, to go through today. Uh, so I'm going to open it up to your questions shortly, but I wanna to talk to you just very briefly about some solutions to dealing with some of these issues that we often find ourselves facing when we deal with um, restrictions on access to information. So I'll say this, we've reached a critical point from which there may be no return. Unless we journalists and media organizations and supporters and consumers of news, big and small, recognize one critical thing, if we keep playing along with this little game that some people and some organizations are engaged in where they block us or won't allow us to get information or essentially isolate us or freeze us out. Uh, and you know, there's this celebrity media musical chairs game. This is skewed in favor of the biggest, the fastest and the best in the eyes of those beholders. One day, if we keep playing along with this game, we're going to be the one without the seat at the table of history. And it's just a matter of time and a matter of attrition. So when you see this happening, I suggest three actions, confront it, document it, and publicize it. A non-confrontational, polite, and professional demeanor is recommended always, but be upfront, be firm about the problem and clear about your desired outcome, be aware that retaliation could be a response. So like a good journalist, never throw away your notes. And also like a good journalist living in the times that we are in now, protect yourself, be very careful with what you do, where you go and how you engage. It's important to remember that when a victim is quiet about unprofessional behavior, often the perpetrators think we're scared. They think we're indifferent or not smart enough to figure out what they're up to. But we are, all of you are, I can tell that and, and just by you being here today, you're engaged and you're important enough, uh, it's important enough for you to know and to be here to do something about these issues that we're talking about. A wise old journalist told me many years ago, just because a person is working for a noble cause, and I mentioned this a little bit to you earlier, for a principal organization that doesn't guarantee they're committed to the ethics expected of them. Reporters and public affairs specialists and elected officials alike, by virtue of the seduction of followers and friends like the ones on social media and the instantaneous fame of television and other forms of media are all vulnerable to this problem that I've mentioned to you earlier called the celebrity effect. The trick is to understand it, manage it, and remember that we're all public servants. 
and that we have a right to do this for the people. So finally, I will tell you, in order to deal with whatever access problem you have, and this is, I genuinely think that this is the key. I'm going to equate this to a door. You know, whenever you want to get into a building or a room, you have to go through a door. The door either has a doorknob, a handle, or a button that will allow entrance. But if you don't manage that door knob, the button or the handle appropriately, you will not get in. You'll be locked out. So the point that I want to make to you here is this. When dealing with access to information, you have to treat the people and the organizations that you need to get this information from appropriately. You have to make sure that you turn, do, do the right turns, push the right buttons, do the appropriate things to gain access. Now, what does that mean? It means building relationships is very important when you want to deal with and get information from sources, from organizations and people, whether they like you or not, it's possible to build a relationship with them, build that relationship, maintain that relationship and continue to do your work and to do it in a way in which it's clear to them that you're not going to one, tolerate um, being pushed aside, two, that you're going to be respectful, and this is key, being respectful, and three, that you will essentially report their side of the story. That's important because a lot of times people don't want to deal with journalists because they think or feel that we won't tell their story. Well, let them know, we'll tell your story, but we're going to tell the whole story and be firm and clear about that. Because oftentimes, and I've seen a lot of this, journalists today who don't necessarily want to do anything wrong, but they're so desperate to get a story, they will do things that they should not do. So make sure in order to gain that information, to get that information, that you do the right thing with that process of getting that information. So re research the target, whatever it is that you want to get before you start, research it. Wherever, whoever you want to get to or whatever it is you want to get, research it. Plan how you're going to access uh, this information or this person or this source. Execute the plan, and then you analyze the result. And I'm going to say a few words to close here. And I'm, I want you to all know and understand this. I'm so very proud of all of you that have joined us today and this organization for doing this. There's way more that I can say today, <clears throat> excuse me, about the situation that we face. But there are so many uh, opportunities right now for us to engage that I'm sure that there will be more, uh, more of this, uh, more opportunities in the future to talk more about this as, as time passes. But today, I just want to conclude by saying, if any one of you has thought about something that you have to say in the last 24 hours, and you've thought about something that you need information to help you uh, tell your story, you, what you need to do right now today is to get started pushing the buttons, turning the doorknobs and the handles to get that done. Because we live in an age right now where people's attention spans are very short. Even media organizations do not anymore allow for more than a day or two for people to hold their attention. They will shift to the next thing. And a part of it is business. Some of it is just the fire hose of information that we get from social media. But it is absolutely important that if you have a story in your head today, or if you have something that you want to research, some information that you need today, start working on it today. And don't let up until you get that information. And the reason that I'm saying this is because often we get discouraged, we get blocked, and we sometimes run into dead ends. And when you run into dead ends these days, it's a lot harder, a lot harder to get past it if you wait, if you sit on it. You have to act immediately, act appropriately, act effectively, act authoritatively, 
and act with integrity. All of which things, they're all things that I know every single one of you that are on this, on this program today have. So with that, I will say thank you for listening uh, and good luck with whatever you're doing. And I would love to answer any questions that any of you might have. Uh, Mr. Green, uh, thank you so very much for this uh, amazing uh, presentation. I think I learned a great deal of information. How to, you know, uh, research, plan, and execute, execute and analyze information uh, before writing your story. And uh, and uh, and also, the journalists has so much responsibility to verify misinformation, disinformation, or sometimes like fake news. And uh, one of the things that you said is uh, journalism is not a propaganda tool and journalists are not the pawn of the government. Uh, I think, you know, like uh, uh, this has been like very uh, helpful for me to, uh, to understand, uh, you know, um, uh, freedom to access information. Now, we can open up uh, for the, uh, the, the floor to questions and answers. Uh, if you have any questions to Mr. Green, uh, just unmute yourself. This is, uh, we would like this to be interactive discussion. Uh, so unmute yourself uh, and you, you can just introduce yourself, your name and uh, where you're from, and you can ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Green, for such a phenomenal presentation. I learned a lot. My name is Melanie um, Formosa. I am a student at Stony Brook University on Long Island in New York. And my question is, we, we try and share credible information, right? And credible information, at least in, in my school, is either a .gov source, uh, if I'm talking about a website here, .gov or .org or um, government officials, right? But what if the government officials are spreading mis and disinformation? How do we combat that? Well, thank you, Melanie, for your question. And thank you for the good work you're doing there at Stony Brook. The way you combat that is be bold. Call that official out. Out that official. Don't allow that official to stand behind a title. Don't let that official stand behind the title to push out information that's wrong, that could be harmful to people uh, and certainly to society. I think one of the ways that you do that is you confront that official directly and tell them what you know. If you've got proof that that information is wrong or inaccurate or uh, it is uh, harmful, if you've got some proof of that, show it to them. Tell them what you've got and let them know that you're not afraid to do this. And I know that sometimes being a young journalist, it can be a bit daunting. I, I, I will recall the first job that I had um, there was an individual that was on my beat. I had to cover a certain area of um, a particular uh, state when I was working my first job. And this individual was the director of development for this particular city. And he was involved in corruption. And I didn't even know I had stumbled into some information about him committing crimes. So I recall picking up the phone and calling this guy and telling him what I had heard and what I had found. And he said, no, that's not true. That's not true. So I also recall hearing that there was an investigation underway. So I called the FBI. Turns out what he was doing was wrong and he was arrested. And of course, he went to prison. So being a young journalist at that time, I was petrified that I had, one, ruined this person's career. And, you know, there was concern about what if there's retaliation. And certainly in this day and time, that can happen. But there was this thing that came out at the end of this whole process that reinforced to me why what I did was the right thing was because of the hundreds of thousands of people who were relying on the organization that I was working for to tell them the truth. So um, I couldn't do it by just taking this guy's word for whatever he was saying. He was saying that he, he was innocent. It didn't sound right. So press on it, push the person that's talking to you and 
or push the person that you believe is engaged in this in this uh, disinformation and in this problematic uh, information sharing, uh, push on it and don't be afraid to do that. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yes, I. But just if I can't contact them, for instance, um, Trump, right? If he was saying that climate change is a hoax and it's not, then how do we promote truthful information if the head of a country is providing misinformation? Well, something as big as that, as that lie, is easily provable. You can easily prove that it's a lie. And what I suggest you do is follow the science. And the science can do that for you. And, you know, we often hear this phrase that there's strength in numbers. And it usually refers to people facing down a situation or a problem um, that, you know, is a threatening one. Information and sources of information can also be a part of that process. There are, gosh, I would say thousands of references out there about how climate change, you know, is damaging our world. Uh, and all of these, the things that, you know, that back that up are out there. Use it. That's, you know, the example is use it and go directly to this individual. And yeah, no, maybe, maybe you can't reach that person uh, maybe you can't get access to that person, but let your audience know that you've tried to reach them and let them know how you've tried to reach them so that they understand that you're doing your due diligence and not just taking someone's word for something. The, the key thing with all of this is to, to think critically. That's the key thing. Think on your feet. You know, if, if one door closes, try the doorknob, the button, or the handle on the next door. Or in some cases, I didn't get to mention this earlier, sometimes when the door won't open for us, sometimes even though it's a little suspicious, we have to go through the window. <laughs> and I'm sure some of us have done that when we've gotten locked out, you know? So if you can't get in through the front door, sometimes the side door, the back door, the window may be open. But, you know, try other methods within the law. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Brienne? Hello. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought we were just going off. Yeah, Brienne, we can go with Brienne, Samuel, and uh, Sumeya, that order. Okay. Hi, so I was actually wondering, you know, how do you report on an institution that might deny access to public records or public information or threatens retribution for staff members who speak to media outlets? Um, like, you know, how do you gather information or confront the institution for for these things well i think there are three ways you can do that and one is freedom of information act which we talked about i talked about this a little earlier uh if you're in the united states of course that's one tool if you're not in the u.s that might not exist where you are but um um the other the other op the the, the other options are um, and I think you said how, just re restate that question. I want to make sure I answer it precisely. Yeah, so I was wondering, you know, how do you report on an institution th that denies access to public information or threatens retribution to staff members for speaking okay. to media outlets? Okay, how do you report on that? Well, what you do is you tell the truth. If you've gotten information or you know uh, of a, a situation where that's taking place, that's one of the biggest and most explosive stories of the day, of the week, and perhaps even of the month or the year. If for instance, you've got a, say a DHS that is withholding information and is threatening staffers, uh, if they give this information to you, there are things, you know, people, there are whistleblower groups and organizations out there that people can go to. If you have a source, that, that has told you that that's happening, um, then try as hard as you can to get that person to be a whistleblower. Uh, and also you can report this information. And that's, that's, that's the beauty of being a journalist is because you know we're, we're, we have to be accountable. We can't just report things just because we think 
you know, that's a great story or, or whatever. We, you know, we have to back up what we're reporting. If a, a government organization is doing that, that's illegal, you know, and you can report that. And there's so many different things that can happen if that reporting, you know, is made public. And that's how we as journalists fight back against that. Report it to the people that this organization answer to and also report it to the public. Let the public know. And I, I would encourage too one, one other step. Dig deeper into to why or who dig deeper into to why they don't want this person or these people to to talk to you to give you this information and dig deeper into you know the history in that organization you know because it oftentimes might lead you to policies or situations that have been built that you don't even know about one quick example uh, in 2018 I wrote I did a FOIA for the Department of Homeland Security um, there was a story that a source had told me about in 2018 about the use of something in Washington, D.C. called stingrays. I don't know if you're familiar with that. A stingray is a, is a, it's, it's a digital vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Basically, it's a, it's, 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 it's a device that police organizations use to vacuum up digital information out of thin air. Uh, and oftentimes this information is used for corrupt or criminal purposes, but in some cases it's used for legal purposes. But here in the U.S., several foreign, um, foreign nation, several nation states were employing these tools on the streets of Washington to basically eavesdrop, to basically snoop on mobile phones, to snoop on computers of U.S. government officials to find out what they were doing. A source told me about this and the source was within the DHS. I knew about it. So I did a FOIA, sent it to them, three years passed. They simply wouldn't respond. That is unheard of. I mean, three years. So what's really interesting is the day before Mr. Trump left office, I got a letter from them saying, we didn't find anything and this case is closed. I knew it wasn't true. I know it's not true now, and I'm not done with it. So I guess what I'm saying to you, Brianne, is to continue pushing. Make sure that story gets out there. Thank you. Welcome. Samuel? Uh, hold on, I wrote it down. Um, what is, what is your, what is, uh, Mr. Mr. Green, uh, thanks for talking with us today. And I, my yeah. name's Sam Rowland, and I'm a student at Stony Brook too, currently one of the science section editors at the Stony Brook Press. And given that, I had an interesting question. What is your opinion on the increasing amount of scientific studies and reports that require payment to access their findings, which is an, perhaps another way in which freedom of access to information is, even though it's not from the government, being restricted in ways that could be harmful? Well, that's an interesting question. Are these scientific journals um, run by private organizations? Uh, most of them, yes. Well, that's capitalism. Um, and there's nothing really we can do about that. But I would say to you, you do have, as a journalist uh, and as a very engaged um, person in whatever it is that information is and somebody who wants it to appeal to them to that you're a journalist um, and that you're doing this in the public interest convenience and necessity Th that is a thing it's called pecan the public interest convenience and necessity and it was a part of the law here in this country until deregulation hit radio in the 1980s, uh, the fairness doctrine required that to happen. So I would say to you, let them know that you're, you're a journalist and you're working in the interest of the public and this information would be beneficial. And no, you don't have these fees to pay to get this information. Most of the time, 
reputable organizations will provide it to you free. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, so PECON's no longer in the law, but I can, but I can request and reference it. To them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. I mean, it's not. It's not a formal law anymore, but the the spirit of that is still 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 in play. I mean, organizations that want their information out there, you know, they'll go along with it. Otherwise, why publish it? You know. If you know, unless, you know, if this isn't public information, then I mean, if it's proprietary information, then they have no obligation to share it because obviously they may not want to if it's, you know, science is big money, big business. So if they need to keep it private for some reason, yes. But if you found out something that you think is of, of the interest to the public and could be uh, of use to the public, regardless of whether they want to keep it private or not, pursue it. There are other ways to, you know, more, more, more other, other ways to, to, to pressure them to, to release it, to do that. Thanks, Samuel. Uh, Sumeya, you can go ahead. Hello, Mr. Green. I'm Sumeya, joining from Texas. And I'm a student uh, at UTSA studying communications with a concentration in public relations. And I'm going to say I really love this webinar a lot. And I felt like I learned a lot, too. Thanks. Um, I even took notes. And although I haven't been looking to journalism as my field of study, um, like in this one, um, I learned uh, once again that politics is also like a factor for journalism. It's like such a dirty game also like and it's hard to find trust for the information especially like since uh, now I'm in the IMU and interning we promote for people to join conferences and make uh, their voices heard about this um, so like are there any trustworthy sites that journalism journalists use at first or like do they like learn it afterwards because uh, as like an intern uh, like if we want to join conferences uh, they like uh, recommend us to write a position paper like if we want and like uh, it just interested me especially since you talked about like the politics and public affairs too. Now let me ask you a question to be clear about this I mean, um, when you say sites out there what kind of information are you looking for? Well, I mean, uh, here's the thing, like, like I said, since I'm interning, like, uh, I, um, when we join the conference, uh, everybody's given a different country. So, um, like, when they're representing that, they have to, like, search their country. So, um, like, they, uh, they just say Google to us, but, like, you know, uh, I just want to like make sure that information is correct because um, uh, this week uh, I was given Estonia as a country, for example. I'm like looking and like it's just so different, you know. Okay. <laughs> Especially well, since it's a country I haven't known. Yeah. Let me let me let me make a suggestion. Yeah. Um, call the Estonian embassy in Washington. Yeah. The ambassador mm -hmm. is Jonathan Vesevyov, and mm. he, he's a personal friend. Um, oh. but I do know that there are folks at the embassy that would be very, very willing to help you research their country. Also, um, there is a group in Estonia called the Lennart Mary Conference. Eva Ek Payuste is the director there. Uh, uh -huh. And he is, uh, their whole objective is to educate people um, about what um, Estonia is all about and mm -hmm. there are many many ways that you can find information about Estonia but more broadly if you mm -hmm. are researching something that relates to a country yeah that's what and, I was asking you <laughs> and you're and, and you're in the U.S. Mm -hmm. call, yeah I'm in the yeah oh saying, okay I'm saying for, for the entire group if you're anyone is in the U.S. and you're, you're working on something related to a, a country and you need information reach out to that embassy um, that's what they're here for, in part to promote the interest of that country. So I would suggest you do that. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you, Sumeya. Yeah, I think we have one more question from uh, AI. I share, I guess. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ahmed Ibrahim, and I'm from Nigeria. 
so actually, I just have a question. Uh, my question would be, in countries where there is hardly a central source of information, that is not even the government can give you a concrete information that you truly believe in, and nearly almost every outlet of uh, news or information is biased by politics, religion, tribe, etc. How do one get to verify or validate the information they receive from a source? Well, that is a very difficult situation. And I'm sorry if you're in that situation, I'm sorry you're in it. But organizations like this one, the Journalist and Writers Foundation has tremendous resources and connections to people that can help you w work your way through that process. And I suppose that's what we're doing here. And that's why I'm here to help you as one of these resources from the Journalist and Writers Foundation. So I would say this, first of all, if you find yourself um, in that situation, there's an organization out there. You've heard of digital investigations, I'm sure, um, digital journalism. Um, there's an organization called Bellingcat. Are you familiar with that? Any of you on this? No. Really. You, so there's an organization called Bellingcat. I encourage you to look it up. This is an organization that can help if you're dealing with a government or a country that is corrupt, engaged in illegal behavior, illegal activities, or situations that are harmful, uh, risky uh, to populations and people, uh, and organizations that simply do not adhere to the the spirit of journalism, free and fair journalism. Um, they have these tremendous resources. They work with citizen journalists. And I think you had a great speaker last week, uh, citizen journalist, um, who talked to you specifically uh, about how you go about uh, going into these places and dealing with these organizations and situations. I think Mr. Kamaldian, Kamaldian talked about that last week. Um, but these organizations like this can help you navigate situations, digital investigative journalist organizations. And there are a lot of them out there, but uh, Bellingcat is one of the best out there. And believe it or not, they have actually proven some very, very significant uh, investigations recently, including uh, who poisoned Alexei Navalny, um, who the people actually were, who poisoned uh, Sergei Skripal in the UK in 2017. Um, they've even identified the movements of people within, you know, these intelligence and spy organizations. And, you know, there's lots of information out there in some of these digital journalist organizations. Um, they're willing to share and develop uh, people uh, and resources for people like us. So I would suggest you take that route. Does that work for you? Thank you very much. I'll definitely do so. Good. Well, I think we have come almost to the end of our webinar session. Uh, I think Melanie, uh, Melanie, yeah, you have your hand raised. Like, do you have a question or your hand is? That must be from before. You answered my okay. question. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Green, again, thank you so much for your uh, you know, wonderful presentation. Uh, we learned a lot uh, and you shared a lot of resources with us as well. And I think you are one of the uh, great example uh, for journalists and investigative journalists, and also the journalists who are very brave. Uh, you talked about, you know, like, and your journalism served the justice as well. I think, you know, that's very inspiring to me as well. Uh, thank you so much. We are happy and we are honored to, to have you as uh, one of our guest speakers. And thank you for your support for the media and uh, communications webinar. Uh, now, uh, you know, before closing the event, uh, I would like to make some announcement, but before I do so, uh, let me give the floor to Ezra. Ezra, do you have any announcement or anything to say before I close? Mr. Anything? Green wants to say something. Yeah, just very quickly, I apologize. I'll be brief. Any of you that want to reach out to me, please do. I'd love to hear from you, okay? Thank you. And also I shared the contact inf information for Mr. Green on the chat and for the, uh, you know, for others, I'm sharing uh, that information uh, again. Uh, so it's uh, public information. 
Okay, uh, so uh, so you can reach out to Mr. Green. Uh, all right, uh, Ezra, any announcement from you? I think in my side, no, but uh, if you mention about the journalism project, I will be glad. Thank you. Great. Okay, so let me give you some brief information about this journalism project. So it is, uh, it is, uh, you know, like it is not mandatory, but we highly recommend you to, uh, you know, for, to join and prepare this assignment. And it is a way to put your story out, and it's a, it's a way to, uh, you know, like uh, write a, a news article that could uh, serve the public. But at the same time, it is a good opportunity uh, for. Uh, others to uh, to learn about your journalism, right? It's a good practice, and we will have uh, uh, you know some of our guest speakers to have a look at it. So we will come back to you with some uh, feedback on your paper. Uh, but of course, you know, like when you prepare this, uh, uh, you know, the journalism project, we would like you to you know like focus on press freedom, freedom of speech and expression, and uh, at the same time, like the cultural peace, human rights, and sustainable development, which these three topics are uh, what the JWF is uh, dedicated to. So, uh, so you can decide on what topic that you would like to write your story. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can choose one of the four webinar session topics or subtopics. So those are fine. So once you decide your topic, you can let us know, okay? You don't have to write, you know, like too long. You can just uh, let us know that, hey, I'm writing about, I'm planning to write about this topic. Uh, then later on, uh, just do some research. Again, as Mr. Green uh, mentioned, uh, he said, you know, like research your topic and then, uh, yeah, and then you know, plan how you would like to conduct your research and, uh, and then how you're gonna execute it and then analyze it. So looking at different uh, sources. So once uh, you do this, you know, like uh, you can, uh, you know, start writing your news article or you can you write your story. Uh, just, you know, like make sure that you, uh, you know, follow the, uh, you know, media ethics uh, and uh, you, you know, give credentials, like you make citations to whichever resources that you're using. And, uh, and then later on, uh, we would like you to, you know, uh, submit those, uh, you know, news articles to us. Uh, you know, uh, a week after uh, this webinar session ended, which is next week. And uh, then later on, your uh, story will be published on our website, on the JWF website, and at the same time on the JWF Academy website. Uh, and also, please, I would like to remind you all to send us your professional portrait photo and uh, your short bio, because we would like this webinar session not only for you to come and listen, uh, but at the same time, this is a networking session. We would like to create opportunities for you guys. And we would like to introduce some of you to some media outlets or sometimes there are you know, people asking like uh, you know, journalists or some like freelance journalists to cover some stories of that so sort. So, uh, so once they reach us to us, so we would like to tell them, look, you know, there is this person and, and this is a news article written by this person. So it's a good way of promoting yourself as well. And uh, so we posted the, uh, the uh, uh, journalism project on the JWF Academy website, and I'm sharing it with you again. So if you go to this link, and when you look at this link, you know, a link, you will see more like detailed outline, but you don't have to follow that, okay? Since uh, you're doing a lot of like uh, story writing for your, uh, you know, for academic, studies as well, so you can follow that as well. And uh, so this is basically, and I mean, it's a good uh, practice, it's a good opportunity for you to put your work out, uh, and then uh, it's, it's a uh, good uh, information for us to share with, uh, you know, other people within our network, so we can be more helpful for you to find a job or at least to, to connect you with some people. Okay. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, uh, lastly, I would like to mention about May 3rd, which is the International Press Freedom Day. So we are planning a panel discussion on the role of press freedom for sustainable peace and development and how uh, local media and journalism contribute to offering solutions to conflicts around the world. So we will have, uh, you know, speakers, um, you know, uh, uh, our speakers to be uh, at the panel and we will have some of you uh, to speak at this panel discussion. 
Uh, so we will, I think Ezra, you will share more details about this. Uh, yeah, temple, flyer right? and more details I will share, so. So it's coming, it's, uh, it's on the way. So uh, do you have any questions about the uh, uh, journalism project or any other thing before we close? Yes, Samuel, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, just to be clear, I know there is uh, I know the I know there is a there is a sort of pitch for it due on the nineteenth. Uh, given the uh, uh, the, uh, given the outline that's uh, shared at the journalism project um, and its request for what is expected by the nineteenth. By the nineteenth of uh, April. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry. I just would like to um, learn about your project name, project structure, or outline, but you don't have to send the, all details. Um, you can send your project uh, after the finished all webinars, uh, your earliest comments. No worries about the April 19th, okay? I think we want to know who, uh, who is planning to write uh, the journalism project, right, Ezra? Yes. Yeah, and also I'm sharing uh, uh, the blog. So, so basically, uh, you can see some uh, news articles from last uh, session. So, you can so take we don't have to, I'm sorry to interrupt. We don't have to complete the proposal on the 19th of April. We just have to tell Ezra that we are going to participate. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. Exactly. And also sometimes, you know, like some, sometimes, you know, some of the participants, they would like to do more in-depth uh, research. And they they are interviewing some individuals. So if it takes a, a little bit longer, it's okay. I mean, this is not like a deadline, but you know, on the professional side, we would like you to, to you know get back to us as soon as possible. But if it takes a little longer, uh, because you're doing an interview or you're doing like more in-depth research, so it's okay. Uh, it's okay that it is a little bit prolonged. But uh, uh, but other than that, the 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 mission, the goal is to have you write uh, a, a story and then that story is published on our blog. Okay, and uh, again, uh, you know, I highly encourage you to send your portrait photo and short biography uh, to us. So we have it in our, uh, you know, uh, portfolio. Uh, and uh, so we can recommend you to some, uh, you know, research uh, some uh, outlets, media outlets. All right, well, thank you so much all uh, for joining. And again, Mr. Green, thank you so much for your time, sir. And uh, so we hope to uh, see you guys uh, next week uh, with another speaker. And uh, until then, uh, you know, be well. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.